In the modern day, the most stark reminder of French colonization in the Americas is probably the presence and identity of the Quebecois people within the Canadian province of Quebec, a population which, on account of its cultural distinctiveness, has preserved a level of autonomy and otherness within the Dominion of Canada. The Quebecois are a unique people, but they aren't the only French population to inhabit Northern America, not even within that region of the continent. Shortly before the establishment of Quebec City in 1608, but well after the first temporary settlements in the wider region of Quebec, the French began establishing a settlement on the coastal lands of what are presently Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Maine, with Port Royal built as the first permanent French settlement on the continent and the capital of what was to become Acadia. But of course today, little remains of the Acadian population. But what if that changed? What if the colony of French Acadia survived? Hello audience, Mr. Z here with an alternate history video for you. If you enjoy this type of content, I highly recommend checking out our second channel, US of Z, where we host all of our new alternate history content. But before we go any further, how about getting a taste of Acadia for yourself? I'm talking about today's sponsor, Mainly Coffee. Based out of Millinocket, Maine, right within sight of Mount Katahdin, Mainly Coffee is run by a husband and wife team who specialize in air roasting specialty coffee in small batches. Mainly Coffee emphasizes quality over quantity and also offers carefully made espresso roasts and a unique blend of coffee cherry teas. If you're a fan of high quality coffee or just want to try a unique taste of Maine, follow the link below to check out Mainly Coffee's website and use my link to get an extra 10% off your order. Every purchase also helps support the channel. Once again, that link is right in the description of this video for 10% off your entire order of organic, fair trade, hand roasted, high quality coffee, and you can also use promo code MONSTERS at checkout for the same offer. Now, back to the video. Acadia was a rather unique manifestation as it was the first permanent French colony. However, the region was eventually cut off from Imperial French support. As a result, nearly all of the French withdrew from the capital of Port Royal and left their belongings in the hands of the Allied Mi'kmaq Indians preserved the settlement until the French settlers returned some years later. Circumstances and necessity had led to close relations between the Acadians and the Mi'kmaq, who the Jesuits among the Acadians had made a great effort to convert to Catholicism and facilitate closer bonds between the populations. As a result of this, the Acadians grew to develop an increasing sense of independence from France, relying less upon French provisions as they grew more accustomed to making the best of their surroundings. These feelings would intensify as they were forced to take their defense into their own hands following raids by Englishmen from Virginia and New England, not to mention the Dutch of New Amsterdam. Despite hardships, the Acadian population would grow and thrive, but as was typical of French colonies, they were not initially settled as extensively as in the English colonies, which were rapidly outpacing the French in population growth and development. Though this being said, Acadia's population was still experiencing significant domestic growth, especially for a French settlement. The Acadian experience, particularly during the 17th and 18th centuries, showcases how a community can operate effectively in the absence of a formal state apparatus. In the 1650s, Acadia found itself under the nominal rule of France. However, this was a rule in name only, as the Acadians pursued a path of self-governance, largely distancing themselves from the authority of the French state. The French administrative efforts, such as conducting censuses between 1771 and 1707 to monitor the Acadian populace, did not translate into effective governance or fiscal extraction. The Acadians neither directly nor indirectly remitted taxes to France, underscoring their practical independence. This lack of direct state intervention was not due to Acadian resistance, but rather stemmed from logistical challenges faced by France in enforcing governance over a remote and dispersed population. The societal structure in Acadia was notably hierarchical, yet it was not underpinned by the typical mechanisms of state control. There was no equal redistribution or collective property, and certain families accumulated more wealth than others. This social stratification did not lead to significant discontent or conflict as the division of labor and wealth accumulation greatly benefited the society as a whole, leading to a fair and structured hierarchy. Religion played a central role in Acadian society, with the faithful attendance at church services and participation in sacraments bonding the communities together. The church in many ways provided a unifying and stabilizing force in the absence of state control. The core of the Acadian governance was the parish assembly system. This non-coercive and voluntary political structure was crucial for collective decision-making on important issues. The assemblies, comprising heads of households and delegates appointed by the people, operated on principles of consensus and high participation rates. Their decisions were typically unanimous or near-unanimous, 
reflecting a deep-seated communal harmony. These assemblies also played a key role in conflict resolution, often resolving disputes swiftly and justly. The relationship between the Akkadians and the native Mi'kmaq people further illustrates the functionality of stateless societies. The Mi'kmaq, a semi-nomadic group with a loosely structured political system, shared a close relationship with the Akkadians, underpinned by mutual respect and cooperation. This relationship was characterized by peaceful coexistence, trade, intermarriage, and shared religious beliefs. Contrasting sharply with the more turbulent relations between indigenous peoples and settlers in other regions of North America. The arrival of the British in 1733 marked a shift in governance but did not substantially alter the Akkadian approach to self-governance. The British, like the French before them, adopted a hands-off approach, requiring only a nominal oath of allegiance from the Akkadians. The Akkadians negotiated concessions with the British, including exemptions from bearing arms against the French or Mi'kmaq, maintaining their private property rights, and upholding freedom of religion. Acadia could be considered a stateless society. The Acadians developed a system of governance that was participatory, non-coercive, that was underpinned by strong communal bonds, religious unity, and cooperative relations with the neighboring native groups. This period in Acadian history offers valuable insights into the alternative forms of societal organizations and governance. It is not too often that we find such an impressive example of statelessness, much less functional statelessness. And this is exactly what makes Acadia so impressive. In 1640, Acadia would experience a civil war, or rather a clash between governors which weakened domestic unity and left the English pondering the likelihood of the colony's sustainability. The poorly defended colony would later be occupied by the Dutch. Conflicts between Acadia and New England became entangled in native conflicts which saw the Acadians support the Wabanaki Confederation and thus in the eyes of New England, Acadia became belligerent against them, demanding retaliation. Hostilities would escalate until 1710 when Acadia's capital was conquered one final time, with France officially surrendering claim to Acadia three years later. The English demanded that the conquered Acadians pledge loyalty to Britain only to be met with resistance. The Mi'kmaq and Acadians raided Protestant English settlements to prevent the establishment of a permanent English foothold in the region in a fashion almost reminiscent to the plantation of Ulster. Following years of continued resistance, Britain finally resolved to end the Acadian problem entirely and initiated a mass deportation program in 1755, and it wouldn't be until 1763 that hostilities finally ended. Collectively, the Acadians had put up roughly a century of resistance against occupying forces before finally being defeated, and even still it took their resettlement to finally bring Acadia under English domination. But this time, things are different. Militarily, Acadia was extremely disadvantaged compared to its contemporaries. As a French colony, its population paled in comparison to the collective English colonies, and insofar as imperial support, it was virtually non-existent. The Acadians had no true imperial oversight or even government in the traditional sense, had effectively no means of enforcing imperial law beyond the parish or county level, and received so little outside support that the colony didn't even pay taxes. In many ways, the Acadians were in a closer arrangement with and more dependent upon their Mi'kmaq neighbors than the French motherland. Acadia existed as a near-perpetual frontier, and this likely contributed to their ability to coexist with the Mi'kmaq, who in turn likely reinforced the frontier-style order. Consequently, this meant Acadia was incredibly vulnerable to more organized powers, but the guerrilla warfare employed by the Acadians and Mi'kmaq over so long a period speaks to their abilities to endure despite the odds. Let's suppose for the sake of this timeline that following France's concession of Acadia to Britain, the British facing heightened resistance from the Acadians refused to invest in pacifying the region, leaving it essentially stateless. A treaty would likely be drawn up in the years following of Britain recognizing Acadian sovereignty on the condition that it never again ally with France. The Acadians would have been proud of their French roots, but recognized that they hadn't been a part of France proper for a long time, and what truly mattered to them was continuing their sovereignty. Some would migrate back to Europe, but the vast majority would remain and continue on as Acadians. The combined Acadian Mi'kmaq population would likely stand at around 20,000, roughly the same size as the colony of New York at the time. The country would continue to function on a largely mercantile basis, with the Mi'kmaq primarily serving the role of hunters and trappers, while the Acadians acted as merchants processing and selling their goods to neighboring colonies in the European market, enriching both the Acadians and the Mi'kmaq. The high export-to-import ratio seeing the Acadians accumulate significant wealth over the years. 
Now the Acadians, despite their lack of aid and low development, would not suffer food shortages as other colonies had during their underdeveloped periods, as the soil of Acadia was regarded as remarkably fertile, fishing was plentiful, livestock ownership was more widespread than in other colonies, and the population was relatively manageable. Day to day, the average Acadian standard of living has been regarded by modern academics as higher than even their counterparts in Quebec. It might be expected that the Acadians would eventually develop a simple trade-based agricultural economy similar to the antebellum south, though in the absence of a cash crop like cotton or tobacco, perhaps not. Without a realistic means of projecting power either militarily or economically, Acadia might maintain a simple subsistence economy, albeit one with a high standard of living, and perhaps develop into a neutral zone between British Canada and the United States. Still, its strategic coastal positions would put in a prime position to develop a mercantile economy, if not agricultural, then perhaps small-scale manufacturing, especially if the wealthiest Acadians began exploring new fields of specialization. Catholicism would almost certainly retain an important role in Acadian life and serve to more deeply unify the Acadians and Mi'kmaq, who after a period of time may see significant degrees of intermarriage, the larger Acadian population subsuming the Mi'kmaq but still retaining aspects of their culture. Inevitably, however, the Acadians would eventually find themselves in conflict, likely at the hands of the United States, given Britain's eventual position of preserving native territories and desiring to check American expansion on the continent. To this end, Britain may come to support Acadia in the wake of an American intervention, likely during the War of 1812 or the Aroostook War of our timeline. In the wake of this, Britain would likely assume a protective role over Acadia, making of it an essential protectorate, albeit one which did little to reciprocate British support other than deny land to the United States and provide the British an additional trade partner in the region. Given the time to grow and improve their domestic defenses, Acadia could grow to become something of an American Switzerland, well-armed, neutral, and wealthy. Certainly as Quebecois identity developed into a more active movement and Acadia transitioned into a more developed state, there may be calls to see Acadia incorporated into Quebec, though the independent streak of the Acadians may lead to some political resistance. It's quite likely that over time a number of Quebec citizens would begin migrating over and settling within Acadia, potentially driving the two states to gradually become more similar as the decades wore on, and increase the drive for reunion between the two. If such a thing were to occur, it's very likely this additional population with a historic independence streak would in turn fuel Quebecois calls for total independence from Canada decades down the line, and perhaps see the region become a fully sovereign French-American state sometime in the mid to late 1900s. But what do you think? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. The US of Z thanks you for watching, Mr. Z, out.